Chris, yeah. That was huge. Go on. Um, okay, hi. Thanks very much for joining us at our very first Cloud Management Community AMA, or Ask Me Anything. Um, we've got a panel of experts here together today. Uh, the Intune.training guys, we got together with them, invited them along, and they're going to be your panel and ask your, answer your questions. We do have a set of questions already submitted, so we'll go through a few of those maybe first. Um, but before we do that, I just want to go through a few introductions. Um, and if I can hand it over to you guys, maybe Steve first, could you do an introduction, please? Yep. So, hi, I'm Steve. I'm one of the co-founders of the Intune Training Channel. Uh, I'm previously a consultant and now I work for a very large organisation. And I'll uh, hand over to Ben. Hey, I'm Ben. I'm uh, the intern at Intune Training. Uh, I primarily focus on a lot of automation stuff around Intune and just device management in general. Uh, I work for Patch My PC, so we get to do a lot more fun automation stuff. Uh, and I am happy to be here. Jake. Cool. Uh, I'm the executive assistant over at Intune Training. Uh, I also work with Ben at Patch My PC and uh, making people's lives easier with packaging apps. I'm going to throw it over to Johannes. Hi, I'm Johannes Gerd Christensen. I'm the stunt guy on Intune Training, and um, I'm very happy to be here with you all. Great, thanks very much. Um, we've got uh, obviously the cloud management community guys on as well. We've got Simon, Dean, Lexi and Dan. They'll be looking at some of the questions coming in and helping us kind of organise this as we go through. Before we kick off, though, um, I just want to give a few um, house rules. Um, not that one, no. <laughs> <laughs> um, so if you if you would mind taking off, uh, come off the your mic, I'll put your mic on uh, as we go through and uh, by all means use your camera. Um, that's fine. Uh, we will be streaming this on the Cloud Management Community YouTube channel. Uh, so just to let you know that. Um, if you want to ask a question, hopefully you do, please add it into the chat. Um, you could add it onto, onto the YouTube channel or within the Teams chat here. And one of the guys will pick up the questions as we go through. It might be helpful if you can raise your hand as well, just so that it highlights exactly where those questions are. Um, so we do have a few questions to start off with that were pre-submitted. I'll go through a few of those first and just kind of randomly go throughout the team. Uh, so Daniel submitted, how are you handling autopilot stability issues for your customer stroke organizations, such as many outages, issues like ESP, not appearing and deployment profile not applying, etc. Coming from 100% solid OSD environment, this is a large concern for our organization. Um, ben, you want to pick up on this one? Yeah, that's a that's a rough one to start off. Um, <laughs> so, I mean, I can only go with uh, my experiences, and my experiences have been sort of working with this stuff since 2017. Um, over the last year or so, I've kind of slowed down a little bit on it. Um, so I do less work now. So a lot of the outages that have come through, or the, uh, sorry, let me, let me rephrase that. When I see a lot of people complaining about things on the internet, uh, I haven't really been aware of it uh, so much so in the last year or so. Um, but what I will say is that uh, obviously there are stability issues from time to time with such a large scale uh, cloud based solution. Um, the the ways that I combated that primarily were um, so obviously everyone has probably got experience with ESP being a little flaky uh, seems to have in the very near uh, in the last couple of weeks. Uh, some huge changes have come through. Um, I don't actually know whether they've been officially announced or not, um, but I know that Jake and Johannes were playing around with some stuff and they saw some pretty crazy changes uh, that were coming through. I don't know whether it's tenant-based, but we can talk about that later. The uh, So I guess my solution to sort of bypass stability with ESP was to not use ESP, and I will die on that hill. 
uh, you do your end users do not need to know that Notepad++ is deploying on their machine. If that gets you past, well, sure, okay. But if they do not need to know uh, that those things are there, then you can avoid that extra level of complexity. The, you know, the whole goal here is to be as simple as possible. Um, the other thing that I would say is that I have never experienced a problem where the profile has not uh, applied that can't be solved by simply waiting a little bit. Now, I know that that is probably uh, uh, a hate crime to say out loud, just wait. But it's it's the truth, right? I, I learned many, 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 many years ago from a great mentor that uh, – if you if you get into IT thinking that things are going to be really fast, you're in the wrong industry. Um, you should be you should be hitting you should be hitting apply, going getting a coffee, looking outside, wondering you know how nice it is, and then maybe a little apply. You know we don't need to be in a rush with this sort of stuff because we've essentially handed off the responsibilities of the infrastructure. Um, so you know these things might take time but once that profile is applied i have never actually seen an issue with uh you know autopilot or the ubi not popping up correctly i know that might well, sound like a cop out but I, i'm going to contest your uh you don't need esp statement there ben um <laughs> while for an That's application you don't necessarily need to have um esp completely agree but there's going to be certain scenarios where Security and compliance require ESP to be there for your policies to be applied to make sure that you're not getting to the desktop before drive encryption started or certain widgets are configured on the device. From a security point of view, start menu, who cares? Don't set it for them. Um, but the, the point is there will be configurations and settings that need to be set during that ESP if you're running sure. a secure environment. Um, and that's what it's there for. Sure, and I mean one of the other. Th oh, sorry, Jake, I'll I'll let you talk. But I was going to say, so one <laughs> of the one one of the solutions to that is you, you're going to let you, Jake talk, eh? Yeah, of course. <laughs> Go ahead, uh, man. But no, one of those solutions is to make sure that anything that is absolutely critical is deployed to the device. Yeah, um, that definitely. will that will happen before the user profile starts. The user will not be able to log on to the machine until the user profile is there. So if you absolutely need that for mission critical and compliance reasons, deploy those things to the device object first, then you should be good to go even without ESP. Yep. Fair answer. And you can always turn off the user based ESP as well. Yes. Adding to that, I if you don't have a strong reason to have to, to use the user uh, ESP, I would advise you to consider turning it off. It adds yeah. very little value. The user, like you have to sort of juggle the, the, the pros and cons of the user experience and what is actually what, what is being applied to the device. Seeing a productive desktop where you can check your email is a lot more interesting to the user than staring at a status screen for yep. another 10 minutes. They just well, don't care. And and the fact that you need to re-authenticate to go into the user ESP yeah. if mm -hmm. there's been a restart, it, it's one of these conversations where how do we make it simple? Well, you make it simple by turning off user ESP. Yep. Also, it's not task sequence. So, you know, which, yeah. I just yes. want to put that, yeah. want to put my hand up there and say, everyone's yep. turning it on because they think it's online task sequencing. It's not. It probably yep. might be eventually. But right now, and the way that it was implemented is not online task sequencing. So if you're turning that on because you think that's what you're getting, it isn't. So, okay. I, I'm going to interject. Uh, actually, two Go points. Um, earlier, Ben had mentioned, you know, like you're it's, you're playing the waiting game a lot of the time. There are ways that you can kind of speed that up depending on what you're waiting for. Um, there's a couple different like scheduled tasks that you can, uh, you can execute to force, you know, different config profiles and that to scan immediately and get pulled down. If you're looking at like things like Win32 applications, scripts or proactive remediations, you can actually kill the Intune management extension service. Start it back up. There's a beautiful log that's there that'll give you some information and it should execute a scan right away. Um, but there are some ways that you can go about getting past that. Mm -hmm. um, and I know in the chat, on at least on the team side of things, I did see Martin brought up, you know, the whole let us define an order, you know, like Ben said, it's not a task sequence. Um, however, in the last, this last weekend, you know, uh, Ben had mentioned, uh, Johannes and I were playing around, 
And it seems now, and again, some additional testing needs to be done. Um, it might be for certain tenants and not everyone yet. But now when you go into ESP and define those blocking applications, those apps actually are the first thing that comes down and gets associated with that account. And then it lets your users in. Previous to literally, it seems like this last week when they made that change, you could have 80 different things deployed out. Those 80 different things would come down in a completely random order. And maybe that third thing that was defined as required or a blocker was the 70th thing that got installed. But now it appears that it actually does those three things, gets you to that desktop, and then proceeds with everything else. Those are my two points. Okay. Great. Um, I don't know if uh, Danielle is on the call, um, but if if you are, um, I don't know if you want to st uh, just reply to see whether that's answered your question. I think you've got quite a holistic answer there in lots of ways, so uh, please let us know. Um, let's move on. So there was a question from uh, Siva. Um, Siva did ask, why do we have to use Windows Autopilot? But we kind of gathered that that might have been. You don't. Do we yeah, have to do. use Windows Autopilot? I mean, we have to remember that, you know, there are, there are people here that are just starting out their journey. They're just kind of learning from the start. So um, who wants to pick up on that one? Anyone? I, I, can, I can take that one. Okay. Um, so there are environments, for example, for example, education, where you don't want to, have to use Autopilot. You can just instruct the user you unbox the device, you sign in with your corporate credentials, and that's it. That just takes care of it. The only thing the uh, autopilot experience does is it streamlines the out-of-box experience and it forces the device into a managed state. That's it. It doesn't do any magic. Well, I'm so going to contest that. Well, oh, the magic. It does do magic. <laughs> the, 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 manage, the managed state is actually... Uh, the connection between AAD and Intune. All that ESP is doing, sorry, not ESP, Autopilot is doing, is bringing up your company branding and removing a couple of pages and making it so you're not an admin. Yeah, Which it's even less. If, if we want, well, if potentially if not an admin, depending yeah. on your deployment profile. Sure. Everybody there's should nothing be deploying stopping without you from admin. But there's nothing stopping you from doing that if you skip Autopilot, you can have that. Correct. Remove Correct. from the device. So, so there is, are, yeah, <laughs> yeah. Just to continue a little bit, there, there is there's been some misunderstanding that if you want to use modern management, you have to use autopilot. And if you're a small shop or your procurement doesn't really allow you to buy in bulk, that that's going to put you in a tough spot. That is not the case. Autopilot is really really nice, and I recommend that people use it if you can. But it's not strictly required for any of this for sure i think uh steve was splitting hairs a little bit there because uh we we used to get into this quite a lot the, all of the different technologies that exist in onboarding a device have their own name and they have their own specific role now this this stream uh this ama is specifically around autopilot now if we were to if we were to really be uh devoutly hardline about only talking about autopilot this would be a very very boring discussion uh, because yeah. as steve said it really only does a very small subset of the out-of-box experience um but we're gonna you know we're, we're gonna ignore that <laughs> we're gonna go through comfortable with you know, that. <laughs> the full onboarding experience and because you know when people think uh autopilot they think the entire thing and the entire thing is basically that that um uh, AAD H1. connection, branding, the ESP stuff, as much as I'm trying to burn that with fire. Um, and, you know, the, the whole experience, applying the policies, doing all that sort of stuff. So, you know, the, there's basically a whole bunch of different spinning plates. Autopilot is one of those plates. Yeah. Cool. Okay, thank you, guys. Uh, let's move on to one more. Uh, this was from Rue Campbell. When using autopilot, you can launch a command prompt as an administrator with a keyboard shortcut. The risk here is a user can then perform tasks like managing local admins, modifying things they shouldn't, creating persistence, etc. Can this be disabled? Or if not, do you have any other suggestions? Any takers for that one? I'll take that because I called dibs on it. Um, okay. Yeah, you did. Yes, you can. Uh, 
there can be a bigger discussion around what actual benefit it provides, specifically around the idea that if you've done your job properly, um, someone sneaking in the back door of a computer uh, should not have access to anything anyway, so it kind of doesn't matter. Uh, but functionally, yes, the answer is you can disable Shift F10. Um, uh, let's have a look here. What do we got? When was this published? August 4th, 2020. Uh, Michael Niehaus posted uh, a post about how to disable Shift F10. I'm going to put it in the chat. Uh, essentially just explaining how to do it uh, and then sort of leaving it up to you to sort of figure out how to apply that. Um, uh, October 2nd, uh, he realized that um, expecting other people to figure out the solution was maybe not the best uh, idea. So he wrote a solution for us. I'm going to paste that in the chat as well. So this is how to persistently disable Shift F10. Now on that, there's been significantly more blog posts. I'm going to post this one as well. This is a great one that I just saw this morning before 5 a.m. Uh, that essentially shows you another way of doing this. Now, essentially what this does is it puts a small file in a location on the computer um, that when you're during, uh, when you're in, when you sort of hit that um, out of box experience, it will just literally disable uh, it will disable uh, the the shift F10 prompt from coming up. Now, there are scenarios that are going to uh, suck for you if you do this. Uh, if you do need to troubleshoot things, you don't have access to that uh, terminal. Um, the other questions you need to ask yourself, are your end users actively going in and opening the terminal to hack the mainframe? Uh, they're not. Yes, the but... answer is yes. Always yes. <laughs> <laughs> it is. Uh, there's a lot. A lot of you guys have still got Gibsons around, and they're all getting hacked. Uh, but functionally, yeah, you know, like you do need to ask that question. Um, and if if you've got if you've got uh, people in your organization that are doing that, you should probably hire them and get them on your team because that's pretty cool. Uh, but you know, just just understand the implications that you're doing here uh, with what you're doing um, specifically. That as soon as you disable that, you can't troubleshoot things anymore. You also have to consider how you get that file on the device to begin with mm -hmm. to block that. I mean, you can have like maybe you're purchasing from an OEM. At that point, you're now paying for a custom image, which can add to build times. I'm sure you're all familiar with waiting for devices. Uh, you know, they usually have like a two to four week wait time. Um, and then doing something like that, you're adding another additional two. You know, if you're ordering in bulk, might not be big as big of a concern. But if you're doing like, you know, small onesie twosie orders, I can definitely add up and add some stress at least there. Um, the but, thing to note is based on, um, I think it's Rudy's blog, you can actually create that as a Win32 application and yep. deploy that out to the device and then do it as a autopilot pre-provisioning and you don't actually need to mm -hmm. do a custom build. Um, so I've had a customer do that previously and it, it works pretty well. Um, and then it's persistent consistently throughout that whole life cycle of the device. Do I recommend it? No, it's going <laughs> to cause you problems. Troubleshooting will be painful, um, especially if you don't have a, um, a removable disk and you've yep. disabled a uh, USB boot in firmware because as soon as you've done that you've got no access to the device you can't pull any of the logs out to understand why it's not working um, yes you could go and disable the win32 app and then reinstall the os and then it becomes this whole event so but the question is the value for removing it is actually quite low um, and more and more uh, what you're seeing uh, the windows team doing is reducing the surface area the blast area inside that scenario mm -hmm. okay you also thanks. lose uh, the whole drop ship option straight from your oem if you're pre-provisioning at that point that's kind of yeah. like the, yeah. oh. of the ultimate goal of autopilot but there's various issues with autopilot pre-provisioning which we're not going to go into right mm -hmm. now yeah, that was uh, there's a few questions on that as was going to be <laughs> I, I was going to ask next, but uh, here we go. Okay, let's do um, it. No, let's um, <laughs> let's pick one more and then uh, we'll go over to see if Simon and uh, Dean, if you want to pick any questions out that are coming in. I think there's a few coming in. So um, 
Do you have an orderly procedure for setting the autopilot? I don't even know how to start. So just like the like going from like zero to 50. Zero to hero. Uh, yeah. Did we do? I don't we've even I don't have a test. In it. We've, yeah. we've yeah, we've we've done videos on it. And, and yeah. OK, so to to go on Steve's initial uh, pedantic statement, if all you want is to get to autopilot, you can do it very quickly. Uh, it, it requires branding applied to your AAD um, tenant uh, for your for your um, uh, for your tenant, for your internal branding. Um, there's a couple of other policies that need to be set. You need to set a, um, an autopilot profile or a device profile, and then you need to get, start getting some hardware hashes put in. Um, there's licensing things, letters and numbers smashed together to make E3 or E5. Um, uh, but functionally, it's it's not super difficult to actually get this up and running, and you should be able to get a, a, an environment or a tenant ready for autopilot, only autopilot, in less than five minutes. Um, as Steve said, we've we've done a bunch of videos on this. Um, so if you've got to spare four or five hours to watch one video, um, we've we've, <laughs> we've probably got that. Um, did someone want to try and find one of those videos I'm and chuck a link it. in the chat? Awesome. I'm grabbing the video now. I know that kind of sounds like a throwaway um, answer, but honestly, the, the the initial configuration of this stuff is really easy. It's the pedantic tweaking and then um, you know wiring up all your policies and your applications and doing all that sort of stuff. So again, don't expect that autopilot is not the it's not the entire process. But if all you want is to get to the point that it says "Welcome to Company Name," uh, put in your credentials. It's it's a couple of minute job. It's very very easy. Yeah. Right. OK, thanks. Um, so, Bean, have you got a question you want to pick out from the numbers that are coming in? Yes, yeah, there's, there's a, uh, one I just picked up from the chat, which is um, what's the best way to get the hash ID? And do we still need to run the PowerShell script at the moment? And that's the best way question. is have your OEM register it for you. Right. Thank you, Jake. Perfect. And, and, and then the next best way is Shift F10. So for existing devices, if you, you can deploy a autopilot profile that will convert all targeted devices to an autopilot object. So for your existing estate, that is by far the easiest way to do it. However, keep in mind, those devices must be turned on and they must have network connectivity. Yep. It doesn't work if the device is sitting on a shelf in a powered off state. And e even if they are turned on and active and in use, it's still going to take a few days. Mm -hmm. um, there yeah, are the scenarios. Throw in there. Oh, okay, uh, no, I was just going to say, um, I, I, <laughs> I don't know whether Johannes was just saying this or not, but if you've got existing infrastructure, um, uh, maybe you're already using uh, Config Manager for your uh, device management, or maybe you're not. Maybe you just maybe you've just got group policy um, objects uh, configured and, and you're managing things uh, <laughs> the old school way. Um, there are ways that you can sort of craft a solution that will um, uh, harvest the hashes of those devices as long as they're within a certain operating system spec. But it's 2022, so. I can only hope that all of the devices are at that level um, that kind of revolve around the the scripted solution um, that the question was around, um, but it sort of allow you to um, grab that information on a global or, a, you know, a large scale and, and harvest that into a central location, whether that is into your Intune tenancy or whether it's just to a CSV that you do stuff with later. Um, there are ways to do existing infrastructure hardware grabs now. Um, so that you can prepare yourself for the um, for the inevitable rollout that you will be doing down the line. Yeah, the, the thing that I will call out is make sure you validate the freshness of those hardware hashes, because we've seen mm. it at multiple customers where I took a copy of this when the vendor gave me the devices a year ago. Half the devices have been replaced and the hardware hashes weren't updated, they import them, and they then go to autopilot and they don't build. So, oh, and the, hard, the hardware hash changes um, if, if there's hardware changes as well, right? Hardware hash changes uh, if there's, uh, yes, hardware changes, but also every time you run the hardware hash uh, extraction command, it's yep. actually changing because it has a timestamp in there. Oh, sure, sure. 
do we know what the sort of the the uh, the life cycle of that um, expected time stamp should be? Uh, look, it comes down to that the lifespan shouldn't, so long as the hardware hasn't changed, so yeah. as in like the CPU, the network card, the sound card, all of those components haven't changed, um, you shouldn't have any problems with that hash aging out it's when a device has had parts changed yeah sure uh, sure sure yeah That's i'm just cool. trying to find a blog about it because i know a guy that wrote up a really good story on it yeah so his name is getting dropped in the chat so to answer um, no there's actually around, somebody else as well all right um collecting the hash why mm -hmm. do we still need to what's the best way to collect the hash the answer is you probably don't need to collect the hash yeah, I guess um, the 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 first answer is get get your hardware um, vendor to do it for you because it's still a pain. Um, sure. The second one is uh, depending on uh, whether you've got existing infrastructure or management, um, the scripted solution is still very much a viable option, um, and it's not something that should be seen as a like don't groan at that. It works really well, and it is still the best way to manually do it. Um, you can leverage that tool to automatically. Um, Gather, gather this stuff, but at the end of the day, automation is just um, repeating steps that are manual. So, um, yeah. I'll throw in a little bit that if you do have config man, you can write a task sequence that will grab <laughs> that hardware hash and upload it for you. Uh, we do have yes. a video on the channel on it as well. Cool. Uh, yeah, that's okay. Uh, okay. I just did you want to add something? <laughs> I just pasted in the chat uh, a link to um, Shannon Fritz's um, blog where he goes through how to decode the actual hardware hash and mm -hmm. break it down to what it actually is. Nice. Um, super, super interesting. But, yeah. Great. Okay. Uh, let's move on. Uh, Simon, have you got a question? Pick a question. Uh, yes, yeah, so there's a couple of questions that have come in from YouTube. Um, one says, uh, which I think we might have already slightly just touched on, which is um, how to enroll existing devices which are available in SCCM into autopilot. So long as you're running a recent version of CM, and by recent version I mean like in the last four years, there's actually a report in Config Manager for the hardware hashes. Mm. That's the good news. The bad news is it doesn't format it in the same format that you need to put into uh, the Intune registration blade. So what you need to do is you either need to create your own report, including the columns that you need, or you need to create it manually over on the other side. So you export it and then go and create it all the way through. Um, yeah. But yeah, if you've got Config Manager, it's already been captured. Um, super important to call that one out cool um and also other... check the freshness of the hash sorry yeah is yeah. the last thing i'll put on that <laughs> and, and i'll reiterate that it's it's mm -hmm. not fun um watching customers just struggle with that one yeah sure um and then the other question i've got for now is another youtube question saying what's the best way to build an intune lab to start learning with it get a dev tenant yeah, you, or, even if it's not a dev tenant, just go and sign up for a trial. Um, at the end of the day, trial tenants are free. You can go for, what is it, 90 days with the trial tenant. Um, if you're wanting to go through um, having a look at your trial tenants, you can go from uh, an E3 to an E5 to each of the separate licenses and you could run that tenant for 12 months. Yeah. Um, there's there's multiple options around that. Um, definitely go and build up a Hyper-V host um, and or VMware, VirtualBox, whatever you want to use, it doesn't matter. Just run it um, and then flip it onto the other side is if you've got test devices, physical devices, there are going to be scenarios where you need to have physical devices. Um, but don't let that stop you. Um, I think there's yeah. a couple of uh, YouTube channels devoted to sort of Intune 
training and you know management of uh, cloud devices. Um, that sounds terrible. Yeah. How about yeah. I missed it too, Steve? Did you mention the fact that that'll auto renew after the ninety days as long as you're using it? Uh, so the trial tenants, they will auto renew if you've got a credit card there, and they'll start charging you. Yes. <laughs> um, dev tenants um, will auto renew uh, every ninety days. So when we say dev tenants, they are associated with the office. Um, tenant. So what you need to have is an existing office subscription, then you can create a dev tenant. Um, where it gets complicated with that is they don't in always include every component of the M365 V5 license SKU. Sure. Um, it didn't include Windows 10, is it? Windows. Yeah, that that's correct. Yeah. But I mean, it's it's good enough to it's good enough to get your hands dirty if if this is the thing that you've never played with before. Um, you know, it's a viable option to at least start the process and see point. what's involved. Yeah. Exactly. Um, and you can always do it in your lab environment. Sorry, I mean your production environment. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I get those two uh, terms mixed up all the time as well. Yeah. Right. Great. Thanks. Uh, I said there were some questions around pre-provision. There was one here from Adam saying, uh, with with regards to pre-provisioning, can this only be done on a device if there is no existing Intune device record? I've seen mixed results with pre-provisioning on a new out-of-the-box, first-time used device versus an existing device that has been imaged. Fails and device preparation during securing your hardware or prepar Preparing device for mobile management for TPM timeouts. Deleting the Intune device record seems to fix this, which leads me to believe the existing record is the problem. Yes, that is correct. It, it applies to both well, self-deploying and pre-provisioning. This is documented by Microsoft. This was due to a change they made back in, on the backend service earlier this year or late last year. And yeah, that, that is the current way of dealing with it. You just have to delete the Intune object. It comes Hopefully. down to a TPM 2.0 attestation. Yeah. Yes. Um, so part of what's required to do self-deploying uh, self and autopilot pre-provisioning to enable the device to do the authentication component for you to the service needs to have the TPM 2.0 chip. If it's not attesting correctly, then that's why it's failing. Um, frustrating, we know, um, but that's 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 where it is. Well, and Andy's talking on mute. Oh, there we go. We are professional here. Yeah, yeah, yeah. There we go. <laughs> <laughs> um, Simon, what else we got coming in on YouTube? Um, I think. That's it for now. Uh, there's a I've, question coming in saying why is um, Intune deployment sometimes really slow? Uh, DNS. <laughs> Certificate. And, 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 you're deploying and, and way too honestly, profile. I'm not even joking. The yeah. number of customers I go into where there is the com complaint about slowness, mm -hmm. it typically comes down to something not working correctly on their network. Um, why, why do I say DNS? Typically because it's, it's a long resol resolve, long resolving line where yeah. customers are routing their DNS back to their central home office, but their mm -hmm. internet connection is on their remote office and it fails. Um, yeah. it times out and there's, there's a whole heap of issues associated with that. So. It's yeah. It's typically going to be either DNS or um, certificates. The best way to prove it's your corporate network is go and run it at home. Go and run it on a hotspot. Demonstrate to your network team. Hey, look, it works mm. when I'm not connected to your corporate network. You may need to fix something. Um, yeah, Steve and I used to. Yeah, Steve and I used to do this when we went out to client sites. Um, we would take a uh, we would take a like a four G um, dongle with us. We would sit down with them. We uh, and, you know invariably this would be from uh, an initial call saying, um, "Hey, this thing you've uh, set up for us doesn't bloody work. What's going on?" 
Um, so we'd, we'd pop into the office with the, with the 4G thing and say, no offense, but we don't trust your network. We would then provision a device uh, from scratch and it would be done in like 15, 20 minutes. Um, then you have to have that hard conversation with your network team, uh, you know, Paul. Uh, but, uh, you know, th there's ways to prove that. Yeah. Um, and, and I may or may not have spent many, many weekends going through DNS and Active Directory domains fixing them for network teams. Oh, yeah. It turns out Steve and I are now network admins. It's kind of cool. <laughs> I have a, a question, yep. which I think is, I like it because it leads into a, a bigger answer and hopefully Ben doesn't do his one word answer. Um, no. Will you the go. end user notice if slash when their device's hardware hash is uploaded to the autopilot list and their device turns into an autopilot device? I actually answered that in the Teams chat earlier. I know, you I know, but um, you're yeah, stealing them all. So. So, <laughs> so, yeah, stealing them so, all. so the answer yeah, is you're not going to notice it. Um, when they reset because, the device or reinstall, yeah. then they'll see it. But like, as if they're just using the device every day, they're not going to notice a thing. Let, let's be honest. When you hit the magic reset button on the Intune console, they'll notice that. <laughs> Actually, they wait, won't Steve. You were important. <laughs> I got one for you. Okay, so you know, maybe maybe this can be a bigger conversation. All right, so you get that hardware hash. You import it into yes. uh, Intune. It starts automatically applying um, uh, device profiles. Maybe you've got an ESP <laughs> profile that hits. Uh, yeah, Dean uh, knows what I'm talking uh, about. All right, so. So, so that, that uh, yeah, yes. The answer is if you've got broken things and you've deployed applications <laughs> to all users and all devices, which you shouldn't, when you import a device into Intune, it can cause issues because it now has an AAD record if it didn't previously have an AAD record, it, and it's now it's giving than some that. policies. It, it's more it it's more common than that because if you've got that autopilot device group, so mm -hmm. say the device is registered, it's all online and good, then you've got the autopilot device group which auto populates based on the ZTDID. Mm -hmm. Then when you upload it, it will go into that group and all of your autopilot stuff happens. So the answer is possibly, or almost probably, in some cases. Mm. Yeah, it, it 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 can. So the the example that I was talking about with Steve is, uh, uh, we 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 accidentally hit the motherload. We got the uh, it was the CTO CIO uh, ran CTO. into this exact yeah CTO um, had their laptop unusable because it was stuck at ESP. Uh, because one of their architects deployed an application that didn't install correctly via Win32 and didn't tell us. <laughs> yeah. So, you know, put it, put it this way, um, Intune, Autopilot, ESP, device configuration policies, app packages, um, all of these things are there. They will not fix things that you do incorrectly. Uh, so, you know, if done correctly, uh, grabbing the hardware hash of a client device will not uh, affect the end user in any way, shape or form. Um, they will not notice that things are happening unless they've got task manager open and they're watching for that PowerShell script. If you're doing it that way, um, they won't be doing that. That's not a thing. Um, but functionally, there are a couple of caveats to point out, and that's specifically just make sure that, uh, the way that you're deploying these things, um, isn't, you know, for, for certain stuff, it's not required or, uh, you're not going to sort of force a reboot on, on the machine, um, you know, doing, doing this stuff, but, um, and it's kind of vague, and but the answer is the answer is it won't affect them as long as you do it right. Don't go and deploy it to all users on day one. Roll it out in a test string, test scenario, validate, and make sure it works before you use, do it to everybody. Yeah. Because well, use pilot groups. Use pilot groups. Yeah. That brings yeah. up another and, great question. Do you recommend mm -hmm. uh, doing user-based deployments or device-based typically? Yes. That's yes, yeah. I mean, right. <laughs> it's gonna so, vary yeah, obviously. Whichever. It, it's 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 a philosophical question, right? Could can you do uh, pr uh, user targeting? Yes. Can you do device targeting? Yes. It all comes down to the scenario that you're wanting to run. Um, certain scenarios work better when user or system. Um, there's plenty of things on the internet on how that works and associated components. Yeah. Um, but what we're looking at, say, for example, we're going and deploying security configurations. They should go to the device. Yeah. Realistically, security goes to the device because we want to secure the device. The user object, yeah, cool, happy days. Um, when it comes to core applications, go to the device. 
if you're going to use autopilot pre-provisioning, which I don't recommend because you're moving the value of going to autopilot back into IT, yeah. um, you then need to do everything to the device. Um, it does but, get to that the, point where um, like Intune was initially designed as a uh, the solution for user centric device management. Um, you know, it's it's a thing that uh, Config Manager attempted um, and kind of never really got it right because there was no nice way of like linking the user in the device object. So yep. Autopilot and, and ESP and all that sort of fun stuff to a lesser extent was the solution there. And that's essentially how do we make sure that this user and this device are connected? Um, and then once you've got that point, Someone just said silver light in the chat, and that's that's too funny. Um, uh, hang on, I just lost my train of thought. I saw silver light. Uh, so if you've got if you've got user and device connected, then it kind of makes sense to like you know initially you go okay, well you know I'm only going to worry about the user because that was kind of the the conceit, the promise that was sold uh, was that um, Intune allows you to worry about the user and not the device. As soon as you start deploying policies to a device, then you kind of start having to worry about the device a little bit. So it does change things. Um, but the the short answer, or the you know the short-ish answer is, um, if it's not specifically for that user or for that department, deploy it to the device. Cool. Okay, let's switch um, switch slightly. It was a topic we weren't gonna avoid, but there's a general one here. More of a general Intune question, is hybrid AAD setup worth it? From things I've seen online, it's no. a bit, it's a bit nope. of hassle for what it's nope. uh, for its value. I mean, don't, don't do it. Question, so yeah. Okay, it is a good I, I question. Go, go to hadge.com is all. So, okay, how do I, yeah, yeah. Um, I'm trying to do this without being rude. Uh, Be rude. <laughs> yeah, so. It, so if you if you uh, decide to go with uh, Azure Active Directory join in in autopilot, you significantly reduce your capability to accumulate technical debt. Where and then you have the opposite if you use hybrid Azure AD join in autopilot. One, you're going to have a miserable experience. It's horrifically complicated. It's slow, and it sort of tethers you to the past. You're not moving forward. You're just using a slightly newer tool to do the same thing you've always been doing. And that kind of misses the whole point. Yep. So don't use hybrid uh, hybrid join in autopilot. Just, just don't, it's not worth it. So you know, with I mean, that longer that's period that's of time, you're adding all the extra complexity as well, yeah. which means there's other points where autopilot can fail. And it probably is going yeah. to be quite a bit when oh, you do yeah. that approach. Uh, I will let you but, answer a little bit more, Steve. I just want to do one more thing. One you. thing, because let's let's all talk. Let's let's have fun. Um, okay, so you know, a lot of a lot of us, uh, not us, because we've been doing it for way too long. But a lot of people's first uh, experience with Intune was when um, businesses had to uh, rapidly pivot to remote work during uh, the thing that we shall not talk about. Um, the you know the primary demand here is that okay we need to re we need to remove uh, move to remote work immediately we no longer have line of sight to our domains make everything work so Intune and the you know the modern management device management cloud platform play you know delicious Kool Aid that that you know is the sort of the end goal uh, works because there's no central domain that you need to worry about per se. As soon as you start implementing that sort of stuff, like Johannes was saying, you immediately add complexity back in. How are you going to get line of sight to that domain when you're doing your on uh, your out of box experience and you've got to do AAD join or uh, AD join or whatever? How do you do that? Oh, cool. You've got to start thinking about VPNs or you've got to start figuring about, you know, just there's a million other spinning plates that you need to start thinking about. Use this as an opportunity to, I'm going to say greenfields. But, you know, use this as an opportunity to start from fresh. Now, if you can't do that, if your environment's not um, uh, mature enough to move to that space, start it as a proof of concept. Show people that it works. Show people how quickly you can get a device up and running and secure. Um, 
as soon as someone sees it, they're going to be impressed and they're going to give you a big bag of money and they're going to say, get it done. That's that's the the answer. Um, but Steve's going to expand a little bit on that. As he always does. Um, so around the, the hybrid AAD joint, right? At the end of the day, from a technical point of view, the difference between hybrid AD join and AAD join is I have a computer object in Active Directory that I can do authentication with. Cool, that sounds fantastic. But as soon as we have that computer object in Azure and in, in Active Directory, not Azure, Active Directory, that then means that that computer object can authenticate across your whole environment, which doesn't sound scary until you use it, get the system, and then they can go and authenticate across your environment and, and in investigate your whole environment. Awesome, right? No security risk there at all. But anyway, let's 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 tease that out a little bit further. So, when you're talking hybrid AD join, a lot of organisations go, "Well, I need it for application X because it doesn't work without that." Well, okay. So, is the computer doing the authentication for application X, or is the user doing authentication for application X? Never, inevitably, it is going to be the user is doing authentication for application X. So why do we need hybrid AD join? We don't. There are some applications that have device-based authentication because at one point the developers thought it was more secure, um, and that's typically the only scenario where you need that hybrid AD join. If you're looking to get into autopilot, if you're looking to play around with all of this stuff, Take the time to say, I'm going to do AADJ until I can't. And it's a very, very simple methodology. You hold everybody to account where you sit there and say, we're going to try this. If we come into a problem, we're going to address it. We're going to review it and go, hey, does this work? Yes, no, this is how we're going to get around it. By the end of the project, more often than not, and I'm talking 99% of the time, you don't need to do hybrid AD join. Period. Yeah, I totally agree. Avoid it at all risks. Um, okay, okay. Let's move on. Uh, we've got one here which says how to enrol all existing devices available in SSEM for autopilot. I mean, generally, there's the the, the question there about you know existing devices uh, devices per se, but this one's about from SSEM. So this is where you're going to. Um, create that report in the hardware hash from config manager, make sure the freshness of your uh, of your hardware hashes and they've synced recently, because if they haven't, then you're in a world of hurt. Um, and that's where you import them straight away. Uh, yes, can you do cloud attach and everything associated? Yep. Can you do um, config manager with autopilot? Yeah. But it all comes down to how far you want to go down that route. There's a lot of spicy takes in the chat, and I'm loving it. Yes, as you as you'd expect. Uh, Simon, thanks, thanks, Steve. Um, anything coming in from YouTube? Yeah, there's a couple more questions. Uh, da, 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 da. Oh, there's a question here that says uh, we're just starting out in our into an autopilot journey. Do I need to do anything with an already autopiloted device if a laptop has a failed motherboard or is replaced? Uh, yes, although they are fixing that. Um, you used to have to uh, delete the autopilot object and re-import the device, but that is being worked on and fixed by Microsoft. Part of the reason why you need to delete that autopilot object is when the hardware vendor reuses that board in another laptop, <laughs> you have <laughs> other vendors then coming up with your autopilot profile and coming uh, up and saying, welcome I, I, to company X. Yeah, but the, the, OK, so to expand on that, because not everyone knows this. So you take your laptop to, in for repairs. They pull the motherboard out and they put in a new one. Now, they don't throw the old one away. They actually go and repair it, and then it gets refurbished into the next machine that gets repaired. That's how that happens. Yep. 
So uh, you need to have that robust life cycle of hardware in Intune because you will otherwise end up with people <laughs> ringing you up and going, I have one of your laptops. Yeah. That I don't. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Cool. And turns out the other side of the world or something. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, but there's, yeah. Th- that's in preview, isn't it? There's um, those changes have come through. Is that in preview yet? Or I did see it come through in the news, but I don't um, know if it... it needs the uh, support from the OEMs, and that's going to take time to roll out to get Dell, HP, Lenovo, whatever, to fix it on their end. Okay. Um, uh, there was there was a good question in the chat. Can we? Can I just bring it up? Go for it. Yeah. 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 Um, so Simon asked, uh, what is your opinion of provisioning packages? Are they a viable option or is it best to avoid them? So the answer is they are a viable option. They, uh, they allow you to customize and configure the device. The question that I ask, as I've, as I've said in the chat, what are you trying to solve? What, what problem are you trying to solve that you can't solve through just doing, um, configuration policies or device configuration? Um, invariably the answer is going to be. Uh, one that can be solved with native policies and configuration items. Um, But that does not mean that provisioning policies are not a completely viable option for customization. Um, I would say it's a little overkill, but if you absolutely love them and say you're, you're that one person in the world who still writes the exam questions for, for the Microsoft exams that loves uh, provision policies, then by all means, continue using them. If you've already got a suite of things um, and they just kind of natively work, cool. But I, I would I would implore you, if you're going down this journey for the first time, jettison the baggage, start fresh. Um, it doesn't matter if you've been working in an organization for 20 years and they've got all this legacy stuff. Do a proof of concept, prove to people that the devices can work uh, with, with minimal uh, pre-configuration uh, because they will, you can, and people will be impressed. Cool. Uh, anyone anyone want to add to that? <laughs> Keep it simple. That's what I boiled it down to. Yeah, sure. Uh, Dean, what what have you got? Have you seen any others that you want to pick up on? Yeah, I've, I've put two together. So one says for a hybrid joint computer, and I'm, I'm not going to go back into that. It's not <laughs> that's not what they mean. Um, so what's the best method to install Config Manager to prepare to prepare for co-management? I'm saying they don't necessarily mean just hybrid because you can do co yeah. without hybrid. And then also, do we have a dependency on CMG in autopilot scenarios? Autopilot into co-management is what I would recommend. It's it's a slightly newer feature, um, which I'll link in the chat down below. But that is what you ultimately want to do if you're trying to get the config man client installed, uh, like from you know Intune or via CMG, whatever it might be. It works both during autopilot and for existing devices that do not have the client. Mm-hmm. It is probably the the best way to get the config manager client onto a Intune managed device by far. And Danny is going to hate me, but if you have problems with it, message Danny <laughs> Gillery on Twitter. He will help you. <laughs> At any time of the day or night. Yes. He's probably even got an SLA, right? Within 30 seconds of sending him a post. Yeah. Mm-hmm. He'll actually fly to your house and like hand hold you. <laughs> but no, and on a serious note, that's going to be the best approach to getting it. You could obviously package it up yourself, but why do that when Microsoft now provides an option to do it for you? I'm going to run into a lot less roadblocks. Cool. Thank you. And right. With there is not conflict with the rest of our pilot which was a major pain in the ass before that feature came out. Mm-hmm. So we got uh, five minutes or so left. Uh, Dean, was there a follow-up to that one? or There wasn't. A f- uh, oh, CMG. Did someone answer CMG? It's nice uh, to I- have, but not required. Right. Yep. yep. There's a there's a question around certificates. We could uh, we could uh, blow past our end time and have Steve Go. explain certificates. Go for it. Uh, no no no. It's one of the pre uh, pre uh, questions around um, Wi-Fi 
yeah. <laughs> Wi-Fi and certificates okay, and, and, devi and device-based auth. Yeah, oh, yeah, okay. So you want me to read that? Okay. This is one from Anders, right? Um, okay. Yeah. With, uh, with our domain join and hybrid join devices, we use an internal CA to provide a device certificate to all devices. This certificate is used by our MPS server to authenticate the device and the local AD group into our corporate Wi-Fi. With fully autopiloted device, we no longer have the access to the CA, nor do I have a group membership with the MPS that which the MPS can use. Is that the one? Three minutes. Go for it. <laughs> I don't. It's going to take more than three minutes. Right. Three minutes. <laughs> so, but you you do have access to the CA if you were to go and use an uh, Endes SCEP server PKCS connector into Intune, and you can issue certificates to the device. Happy days, nice and easy. Done. Tick the box. NPS. NPS part of its authentication when you're doing a uh, uh, device based or even any sort of authentication. It expects to go and look into Active Directory to see if the computer object exists. If the computer object doesn't exist on the certificate, therefore, I don't trust you. It's not a validation text. You're not going to get access to the corporate network. That's your pain point. Why don't I seem concerned about that? It's because MPS only does auth n, so it only does authentication. It doesn't do auth z, so it doesn't do the. Uh, authorization this is where you want to be able to go and check to see if the device is compliant as well as authenticating correctly to make sure that you're connecting to the right network and the right vlan because you don't want a non-compliant device connecting to your corporate network to have access to your corporate resources even if they're authenticating correctly this is where you need to start looking at one of your um, network providers radius services so whether it's uh, Cisco ISC, whether it's uh, ClearPass Aruba, um, this gives you the ability to sit there and then do both the authentication, which is going to typically be either PEEP or EAP TLS, and then it gives you the ability to do the authorization, which is the compliance status of the device, because you want to make sure you're authenticating securely to your corporate network. Um, did that really answer the question, or do I need to go further? Yes, I think you and have to be more confused, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so it's just a normal day. Um, we, yeah, Steve, Steve and I have actually uh, got a video on that coming up soon-ish, next couple of weeks, I think. So, um, yep. but yeah, the, the, yeah, there, there's no short answer. Um, there are solutions. It, it, networking is a nightmare. The, 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 the answer is. Use the radius service provided from your network vendor. Um, NPS is fine for certain scenarios, but it's now those scenarios are becoming less and less. And on that, we we hit the hour, so it's probably a good time to 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 end. Thank you so much to you, Steve, Jake, Johannes, and Ben. That was brilliant straight on the questions uh with answers um uh, anyone what's still on go to their website go see the youtube channel there's lots of you autopilot videos on there we have a few ourselves so check us out as well um and thank you so much for joining and submitting your questions it proves that this topic will go on and on i think um, oh, yeah. just just from the fact that there's so many people interested and wanting to submit their questions so thanks very much again and uh we hope to do a follow-up session as well so look out for that thanks very much okay cheers thank you guys <laughs>